Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on KXAN Live. Let's listen in to a news conference being called by a Texas Republican representative who's making a major announcement about the Texas House Speaker's race. Let's listen in. Two weeks ago, Republican voters across Texas sent a strong and unmistakable signal that Texas needs a new paradigm. Ineffective leadership brought about the first. The frustration of the voters underscores the second. For these reasons, I'm announcing my candidacy for Speaker of the House for the 89th legislative session. I've been listening to the voters across the state as well as the grumblings of my colleagues, and I understand the need for a new paradigm in the Texas House. Here is my vision. The Texas House is a collegial body, but there is a difference between collegiality and capitulation. The majority must not be held captive by the will of the minority. And I believe that the majority party should hold all committee chairs. The people elect us to come to Austin to address the issues that matter to their community. They do not elect us uh, to attend a party. They expect us to work. The House should be organized quickly and efficiently and get on about the people's business. Committee chairs should be appointed, organizational meetings held, the speaker should refer bills, and committees should be holding hearings soon thereafter. The House has developed a practice of delay during the first 60 days. That must change. The governor will undoubtedly declare emergency items early, and once he does, the House should work at the same speed that we use in a special session. And these items should be on a calendar for floor votes post haste. While we have many fine attorneys in the House, you shouldn't have to be an attorney to pass a bill. House rules have been weaponized to selectively punish individual members. Our parliamentarians have played an outsized role in the legislative process. When members question their rulings, they chafe, and the people's business is left undone. In a new paradigm, the speaker should be nominated in caucus and elected on the floor with 76 votes of the majority party. The backroom deals of the past undermined collegiality and drove a wedge between members. This practice started much of the dysfunction that was on display last session. Members are elected to represent their district. They should never forget that. Too often, members have been compelled to follow leadership instead of their district. In other cases, leadership misses out on opportunities to protect members from incorrect assumptions about certain issues and their districts. Districts have issues of a proprietary nature, local bills that have no statewide impact. With few exceptions, these bills should be advanced and adopted by the full chamber. Delaying or outright killing local bills has been used as punishment for members or used to extort support for other legislation, and this practice will stop. When I think about how a speaker should measure success, I believe it can be summed up in that the success of members carrying out the will of the voters means that the members will have a good session, and if the members have had a good session, then the speaker has had a good session. And that means that I firmly believe that every member should have the opportunity for success, whether in the minority or the majority. But back to the nomination process. The House Republican Caucus should follow their bylaws and hold a meeting on December 1st and hold successive votes until they achieve the requisite number of votes to nominate a member. If I am the member who is nominated, I will go to the floor in January and work to achieve 76 votes of Republican members. If the caucus nominates another member, I will work to ensure their election on the floor. In short, I am fully committed to that process. To anticipate questions that you folks may have, let me first address two elephants in the room. First, the impeachment vote. I believe that the secretive way in which this was handled, surprising members in the waning days of a regular session and giving them less than 72 hours to decide was a colossal failure of leadership. Second, the school choice vote. I believe leadership missed an opportunity to protect members by allowing that bill to fail. The speaker's race is largely conducted in one-on-one -on -one conversations with members. It's not conducted in public like other political campaigns, but this contest will be a little bit different. There needs to be a level of transparency because the conduct of the Texas House has lost the faith and confidence of the voters. I believe our new paradigm can change that. 
I filed my declaration of candidacy with the Texas Ethics Commission this morning, and I begin my campaign today. I look forward to visiting with my colleagues and earning their support, and I thank you for your time. Questions? So they would now, and now it's now and not after the runoffs. I think I was so taken aback by the dramatic change that we saw with the primary, it sort of answered the last question in my mind, which was, did leadership know something I didn't know? Um, and yet, when we saw what we saw, it became clear to me that the status quo is too dysfunctional to continue, and a change from top to bottom is needed. Did you give the speaker a heads up that this was going to happen, or did you just let him get that to you? I, I have not talked to any of my colleagues about this prior to me filing for this today, because quite frankly, as you know, you can't. So I'm sure he and I will visit about it later. I, I will say that I have respect for a lot of the things that he has done. I think he's been a good representative in his district, and I hope that the members of his district will contemplate that as they're deciding what to do in the runoff. Um, but I think at this point, uh, leadership change is required at the Texas House. You mentioned that the, um, uh, you mentioned that it was, um, this decision was secretive. Why you mentioned that now and not last year that the process was secretive? I think everybody knows that the process was secretive. And, from, and what I mean by that uh, is that None of us knew this was gonna happen until it happened, except for the people that were working on it. And, and if I'm not mistaken, that actually has been a matter of, of public record before. Have you talked to the Lieutenant Governor about this announcement? I haven't talked to him specifically about this announcement. Obviously, uh, as has already been reported, I, I do know him quite well. Uh, we are neighbors. Uh, and so, you know, I know he's busy with the Senate right now, and he's busy making sure that Donald Trump is reelected president, which uh, I'm grateful that he's doing that. Uh, we do have a good relationship, so we do talk about things periodically. We have through the years about policy and other matters, and I'm sure we'll have much to discuss. And why do you have no Democratic chairs in the House? That, that would be something that would be under your speakership? Yes, under my speakership, there would be no Democratic chairs in the House, and, and let me expound upon that briefly. Um, it is dysfunctional. I myself, in the two terms that Dave Phelan has been Speaker, have experienced in both sessions uh, my legislation being killed by a Democrat chair. Uh, it, is, it is one of those situations where you put somebody in a position of power, and then you're surprised that they actually use the power that you gave them. Uh, and so this is a process that has been dysfunctional for a long time. I think our voters recognize that. They are asking for change. Um, and I am going to stand up today and, uh, and say the quiet part out loud and just say it is time for that change. I am going to do what the people of this state have been asking the majority party in the Texas House to do for the better part of a decade, which is to lead as a majority. Your model sounds sort of like a congressional model. I mean, I would say, I can't speak to how Congress does everything that they do, but I would simply say that 99% um, of what we do in Texas is bipartisan, and I think if you talk to any Democrat member of the House, they would confirm that my four-session track record has been one of extreme bipartisanship and willingness to work with anyone. I have always been someone who cares more about policy than names on bills and personalities, and I don't keep score. I'm just here for the win. I'm here for the policy. So I think we're still going to be highly productive regardless of who's in the chairmanship position. What are some of the conservative priorities that failed to pass last session that would be uh, some of your priorities if you were to leave the chamber? Uh, the number one would be school choice. And I think uh, anyone who was paying attention on election day saw uh, that the failure to pass school choice had a significant impact on the the new composition of the Texas House. In fact, it was probably the biggest thing. Uh, and so this is an issue that's time has come. Um, I would say also related to that, we have some unfinished business with regards to funding public education that needs to be taken seriously as well. But those two issues must go hand in hand. And I'm committed to working with the Senate and with the governor to make sure that that happens and that happens early. I can take one more question, sorry. I mean, anybody else in the back? Gotta, Okay, all right, go ahead, sir. Are you worried at all about another Republican united with the Democratic caucus? Is 
select their own speaker, or do you think the environment's changed such that that wouldn't be viable? Uh, honestly, I think that the environment has changed significantly. I think that you always have that possibility. Uh, and I would just simply say that respectfully, I couldn't vote for that in my district. And I know the majority of my colleagues in the Republican caucus, if they voted for that, their districts would certainly hold them accountable for that decision. And, and so, you know, I, I, part of the reason that we're doing this is because this has been such an outcry of our voters. This is the thing that you need to do. Uh, and so I am standing up today and saying, I've heard you, I hear you, and we're going to do that thing that you've been asking to do. What is a good example of a uh, conservative party that has not passed the Democratic initiative? Um, so this session, I would say it isn't so much of a conservative priority issue as it is members' bills. My personal story, this session I carried a bill which some of you like, some of you don't, had to do with gender modification of children. I had a Democrat committee chair kill two bills of mine that were not controversial at all, just to show me, basically. And she even told the stakeholders, the paramedics that were working on providing medical services in underserved communities, you don't have a subject matter problem, you have an author problem. And I want him to know how angry I am at the bill he's filed. So thank you for your time, um, and I look forward to visiting with you in the days to come. Thanks again for sticking with us on KXAN Live. Will Dupree here in the KXAN Live studio. Uh, we just heard there from Texas Representative Tom Oliverson, a Republican from Northwest Harris County. He is announcing his candidacy to become the next Texas House Speaker. Uh, this is all happening. We cannot forget uh, as the current House Speaker, Dade Phelan, is facing a political fight for his life. Uh, he finished second in a primary runoff and uh, that he finished second, rather, in the primary uh, back earlier this month and is now advancing to a runoff against a challenger named David Covey. And uh, Speaker Phelan has faced a lot of pushback from some of the Republican members of his own party. And it looks like now we are seeing the uh, next candidates emerging at this time, possibly showing that they uh, doubt whether or not he could be able to win that primary. So this is something definitely to watch. Uh, there will likely be other candidates that will be entering the race to become the next Texas House Speaker. And we, of course, will keep following that. Uh, but just to reiterate there, uh, we have our first candidate to become uh, the next Texas House Speaker. That's Representative Tom Oliverson from Cyprus. Uh, notably, he mentioned there uh, one of his uh, policy achievements that he would point to. Uh, others would disagree with that, but uh, last session he uh, helped shepherd through Senate Bill 14, which uh, bans certain uh, treatment options for transgender minors, namely uh, that they cannot receive puberty blocking medication, hormone therapies, or surgeries to assist in their transitions. Also, doctors could lose their medical licenses here in Texas uh, if they provide that care. Uh, we should note that uh, the Texas Supreme Court heard a challenge to this law, so that was some, another thing that we're going to have to follow in this case. So these are a few of the pieces of this puzzle that we're uh, tracking right now, so stay with us as we continue to report out that information. Uh, once again, I'm Will Dupree here in the KXAN Live studio. Thank you all again for joining us. We appreciate that. We'll see you back here at another time. I hope you all stay safe and healthy today. Take care.